Hello everyone and welcome to this eChurch video for Sunday the 14th of June, the first Sunday after Trinity Sunday. This weekend is quite an important one in our church life because uh, we are on the cusp of being able to reopen our church building. Uh, we're doing it for private individual prayer only in accordance with the uh, permissions that have been given by the government and the national church uh, and we're trying to do it uh, in a safe and sensible way but it is a step a step in the right direction and a step back to a more familiar way of being church together and I look forward to seeing at least some of you in the church building uh, uh, in the coming days do look at the notices in the weekly sheet and on the internet for more information about that do be assured of my continued love and prayers for you all and uh, do please make use of this video in a way that helps you to pray and may God bless you all. God so loved the world that he gave his only son Jesus Christ to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God of truth, help us to keep your law of love and to walk in ways of wisdom that we may find true life in Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. They had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people 
all answered as one. Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. O be joyful in the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is gracious, his steadfast love is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Therefore, Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits, to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Jesus says to his disciples in today's gospel reading, you have received without payment, give without payment, or to give a more precise translation, freely you received, freely give. These words of Jesus put me in mind of the story of a boy who asked his father to take him to church. He wanted to find out what it was like, so along they went. The lad listened carefully and watched everything like a hawk. The hymn singing, the sermon, the action around the altar. As soon as the church service was over, the boy's father launched into his rant. That was a total waste of time. The organ was out of time and the choir was out of tune. The sermon was boring and much too long. The servers looked like something the cat dragged in and it was cold. 
Come on, Dad, said the boy, who'd also watched carefully as the collection plate went around. It wasn't bad for 10p. That story demonstrates that we can't really apply the same kind of thinking to church going that we apply when we go shopping. Buying things is a transaction we understand. We have to weigh up how much things cost against what we need and what we want and make decisions about how to spend our money. We have an idea of what constitutes good value, a good product at a keen price. But that way of thinking, as I said, doesn't really apply to church going. We don't charge people to come to church and we certainly never will. Freely you received, says Jesus. Freely give. And that instruction to his disciples, like every instruction Jesus gives to his disciples in the New Testament, has to be read as an instruction to us, to those of us who claim week in and week out to be part of an apostolic church, which is to say a church founded on the testimony of the apostles whose names we read earlier and which seeks to follow faithfully in their footsteps. So in saying these words to his disciples, to us, Jesus is telling us that the church is an economy of grace. The grace of God comes into the world in Christ by the Spirit, the same Spirit of Christ that animates the church that is now the bodily presence of God in the world. And the grace of God, Jesus tells us, shouldn't stop there. It should flow through the church and out into the world. Freely you received, freely give. And there are a few things to note about an economy of grace as it works out in practice that I'd like to outline for you since these are all essential to how the church should operate. They are also, it seems to me, timely reminders as we find ourselves facing a long and difficult journey back to a more familiar way of being a local church. First then, an economy of grace is one that is built on generosity, not scarcity. When it comes to the material things of life, our normal economic considerations are preoccupied with trade-offs, with difficult decisions about how to allocate scarce resources. An economy of grace is very different. The grace of God is not given to us because we deserve it or because we earned it, and it is given with reckless, spendthrift abundance. Freely you received, says Jesus. Freely give. So our church life needs to be characterised by the, the same generosity that God has shown to us. It is so easy to attend too closely to the scarcity of some of our resources and forget how much of what we have is an entirely free and undeserved gift. Recently, St Nicholas Church has been the recipient of an extraordinary act of generosity by one of its former members. Judith Fawcett was a regular worshipper with us for many years and was baptised and confirmed in her 80s just a few years ago. We heard in April that she had left us over £90,000 in her will. Generosity like Judith's echoes the generosity of God, and that should be the norm in our Christian lives. God's generosity to us in Christ calls for a generosity from us to one another and to the world. Exactly how that works out is something for each individual Christian to consider prayerfully for themselves. But if we're not considering it at all, well then something's gone a bit wrong. Secondly, an economy of grace is built on uh, forgiveness and reconciliation and not on punishment and reward. When it comes to our relationships with one another, a very natural way of proceeding is to punish people when they do things we don't like and reward them when they things, do things that we do like. Of necessity, that is how human systems of justice and law enforcement need to work in large measure. But an economy of grace is very different. If God were to take this approach with us, we wouldn't really stand a chance. Instead, God forgives us for the things that we do wrong and offers us, if we accept God's forgiveness, reconciliation, a chance for our relationship with God to continue. And our church life needs to be characterised by that same grace. Freely you received, says Jesus. Freely give. 
relationships in churches are no less strained and difficult than they are in any other walk of life. We irritate each other, we disagree with each other, we disappoint each other. Sometimes these frictions are made even worse, not better, by the fact that we are a community of faith, since religious commitments connect with the deep places in us and conflict, conflict about religious things can therefore be particularly painful and difficult. But our Christian faith demands, demands that we extend the same grace to each other that has been extended to us, that we forgive each other and seek reconciliation. Thirdly and finally, an economy of grace is built on restoration and sanctification, not on praise and condemnation. When it comes to our identity as human beings, there's a ready temptation to divide the world into good people and bad people, heroes and villains. We see this playing out as a theme and variations in every era of human existence, including our own. An economy of grace is once again very different. As Christians, we believe that the deepest truth about our identity is that we are created and loved by God. This too is an act of grace. God knows we're not perfect and offers to work within us and alongside us to restore us to the people God always intended for us to be. This process of sanctification, of being made holy by God's Holy Spirit, is the great adventure of the Christian way of life and is also an act of grace. And again, that same grace needs to be at the heart of the way that our church operates. Freely you received, says Jesus, freely give. Helping people to discover their God-given identity, praying for them and with them, coming alongside them as they seek to live out their unique calling to be the person God created, that is what we are here for. So we must resist the temptation to look on one another as either a hero to be lionised or a villain to be condemned and demonised. The human world does not divide into good people and bad people and the division between darkness and light runs through every individual human soul. Our job is to collaborate with the Holy Spirit in trying to make as much space as possible for the light and to help others to do the same. As we now begin a long journey back to a more familiar way of being church, we discover that by God's grace, we also have a chance to ask how we would like things to be different when we return. Some differences will be imposed upon us, safety measures, hygiene restrictions, but others may be the ways in which God redeems this crisis. My prayer is that we will be able to build a community that is even closer to the economy of grace that I've described. A generous community, a reconciling community, a community of people undertaking the great and joyful adventure of discovering their God-given identity. Freely you received, says Jesus, freely give. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, As we find different ways to be church during this pandemic, help us to listen to you so that we focus on being your disciples. Help us to trust that you know where we are going, even if we seem lost. May we engage with people compassionately, not leaving behind the vulnerable, elderly, disabled, or any not able to use technology. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Church of the Province of Myanmar and the Most Reverend Stephen Than Mayant Hu, Archbishop of Myanmar and Bishop of Yangon. We pray for our own diocese, for Bishops David, Nicholas and Christopher and all your disciples in this place. Lord, may we respond to your calling to be your disciples. Lord, we pray for people in every nation, 
of every creed and every colour. We pray for all those who are in positions of power and governance. Grant them wisdom and compassion so that they may seek justice, peace and dignity for all. Help those with difficult decisions ahead to see your guiding light. Lord, may we respond to your calling to be your disciples. Lord, we pray for our city of Lincoln, for all who keep our infrastructure going at this time. Help us to find ways to support the vulnerable, the lonely, and those in any kind of need. We pray for the work of the food banks, for those who work in health services, for those in retail as more shops can open up. We pray for all involved in education, trying to work out the best way forward. In our own parish of St Nicholas Newport, we especially pray for those who live in Honington Crescent and Jubilee Court. Lord, may we respond to your calling to be your disciples. Lord, we pray for all those who have asked for our prayers, for those we know who are ill at this time, and those caring for them, for those whose needs are known only to you. We pray for all those working on a vaccine for COVID-19. May they not be overwhelmed by the tasks given to them. We pray for all who have roles in the background, unseen but vital. Lord, may we respond to your calling to be your disciples. Lord, we pray for all who have died recently and for those whose anniversary of death falls this week. We pray for all who mourn, remembering those who could not attend a funeral at this time. May all know your love and peace. Lord, May we respond to your calling to be your disciples. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Searchable, the first one 
Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.